All right. Uh, so I would normally stand up and do this, but I, I know if I bend over and keep pressing the button on this thing, I'm going to ruin my back, so I'm going to sit. But uh, <clears throat> I apologize for anyone in the back row. If I'm, my face is blocked, I'll get up and move around occasionally and use the whiteboard. Um, <clears throat> I also um, make it clear um, this is definitely going to be about selling software development projects. Um, so FileMaker is the context because that's what we mostly do, and so a lot of what we're going to talk about is in that in that context, and so it's going to be familiar and we can talk about it. But that's really what the bulk of this is going to be talking about is the processes around that. So I want to make sure everyone's got the right expectations, and I also want you to know you can interrupt me at any time because I want the conversation to get started. I'm not sure how long these meetings really go, but I'm going to try to talk really fast and get through slides and everything, but I can stop any time we want to to debate, discuss, and so on. So the main point here, I think, is uh, we read this book actually in, the, in our book club in our, at our company um, a few years ago, maybe a year ago or so, uh, To Sell as Human. And the basic point there is that we're all selling. I don't care if you're a junior, junior developer who's just dealing with the clients on this particular feature or never talking to a client at all. You're convincing your boss, you're convincing your spouse, your girlfriend, the person at the store, uh, the person who's pulled up at the stop sign. You're constantly negotiating and trying to convince and persuade people to move them from where they are to where you want them to be. And so... I think a lot of this is going to be universally helpful to you whether you're formally selling software projects or not. <clears throat> so I'm going to quickly tell you who I am, what this is and isn't, the art and science of selling, some frameworks, that's one slide. And the bulk of the time will be spent talking about a sales process, in particular the skeleton key sales process, which after having talked some time today with Kevin and a number of other FileMaker developers, isn't altogether that different than maybe what BB Services does, but there's obviously lots of differences inside the art part of it as opposed to the science. Um, We'll talk a little bit about what the customer experience is supposed to be all about and then talk about what I think we could be doing better at Skeleton Key and then hopefully get all of you to start talking about stuff as well, you know, what you've experienced, good, bad, and otherwise, on the giving or receiving end of this topic. <clears throat> so I'm a co-founder and president of Skeleton Key. We're a platinum level FileMaker development company in St. Louis, um, much like DB Services, about the same size, number of developers, revenue, the whole nine yards. We also have a managed services group called BrightSource IT that does managed services, Max PCs, living in harmony, good fit for us in terms of working and collaborating. I'm a certified developer, but I don't develop on a daily basis anymore, but I'm you know, certified way back to eight or seven, whatever, something really long time ago. Um, I'm a business owner, obviously. I'm a consumer, which means I'm constantly being sold to. People are calling me all the time trying to convince me to buy stuff, and so part of this is just not wanting to sell the way people sold to me. Um, and then I'm kind of a reluctant salesman. I took a year of sales training a few years ago, and then I hired a sales guy because I didn't want to do it. And uh, that's because I was being taught to sell in a way that was completely the antithesis of the way I like to talk and persuade people normally. So for me, this was about coming up with a sales process I could live with. Um, so today, what we're going to talk about is selling solutions to people, you know, developing and relying on processes, uh, mitigating risk. These are all the kinds of things you deal with when you develop anyway. They're not necessarily just about selling. You do the same kinds of things when you're building software. It is not a how-to on how to sell. It is not a paint-by-paint -paint foolproof plan on how to sell or convince people. It's not case studies and details where I say, here's the project and here's how I broke it down and how many hours, because that would just be too specific and narrow and we would debate it, debate it endlessly. And we all know that estimates tend to be wrong anyway, and it takes humans and developers to kind of rein them in. So this is not what this is about. Um, and it's not going to guarantee anything. If you do this, you're not going to get better at selling or better at getting right estimates, but you're at least going to have some boundaries around the process and other things that help at least mitigate some of the risks associated with it. So I call it the art and science because there's a lot of different components of the whole thing. If you think about it, there's, um, you know, there's some style and creativity and skill and other kinds of things associated with the way that you actually come up with the estimates or talk to your clients or you know, convince them to open up or probe at the questions and underlying reasons that they're doing things. And on the other hand, you're going to have tools. You're going to have spreadsheets. You're going to have databases. You're going to have math and other kinds of things that you're going to employ. They're going to help you come up with the right numbers or contingencies and so on. I've you know, been learning from Kevin today about different things he learned in project management training, which kind of helped him understand different methods for estimating and very mathematical-based approaches, ways to kind of diversify your approach and come up with better risks. You need both of these things to be able to sell or convince someone of something. Whether you're trying to convince them to a client to sign on an $80,000 project, you're trying to convince your manager to give you $5,000 for training. You need to still be able to come up with a little bit of persuasive capabilities to make your case and also some actual hard metrics and ROI that maybe you can exchange as a way to get, you know, why is it worth spending this time, your lost opportunity, the money you're going to spend, the travel costs, you know, these, these are all part of any kind of persuasive moving people to make decisions about parting with resources to gain other things. There's a lot of frameworks out there you're going to hear about. Um, you're going to hear about 
social selling, value-based selling. Uh, FileMaker is a big fan of conceptual and strategic selling, spin selling. You can go search for sales online on Amazon and find a million books on selling, and they're all going to give you their system and their method on how to do it, and it may very well involve processes, and often they involve gamery and trickery and other kinds of things that aren't a good fit, and I'm going to recommend you go ahead and read those things and glean from them what you can, and if you have no personal stake in it, maybe you'll adopt one of those and it'll work very well for you. At Skeleton Key, we decided to come up with um, you know, two main ways we're going to approach our selling process. Um, one is to set expectations for everybody. So, and this is, again, you can apply this to more than just selling, but I want the client and I want me and my, myself and the client basically to always know what's the next step or what is expected of each of us at each stage of the process. I don't want anything to be up in the air and unclear. And I want the selling process to reflect what it's going to be like if you work with us. Because uh, one of the most difficult things you can imagine, you know, is coming out of a sales process where you've spent, you know, a handful of hours talking to me, and then suddenly, like, going from, like, I don't know, pavement into sand, running into a development team that's a completely different animal. You know, it would be really disruptive. The client, I think I'm, I remember seeing a, a presentation recently by a guy named Joey Coleman. He was talking about they've measured the fact that when people buy things, in the first 15 minutes after they buy things, they go through a dramatic drop in enthusiasm and remorse associated with their purchase. It is just natural part of the getting excited about actually clicking buy and then getting disappointed after you bought it. And it happens in real life. It happens, you know, when people say, will you marry me? And they say yes. And then there's suddenly this drop of blood pressure and other kinds of drop of endorphins. It happens in all different kinds of transactions where you consummate something. And the same is true when you're selling something. So we try to make sure that the selling process reflects our culture and that the development process reflects our culture, which is, you know, these things you see up here, taking care of one each other, making sure we make things better than we left them, we found them, being responsible and speaking truth and candidly to power, you know, including the client, and, um, and make sure that we do that throughout the sales process and we make sure we talk about that with the client during the sales process so that they kind of already know what to expect. I tell them at the beginning that we're an open book company, that we talk about money, that we talk about it all the time so that they know that it's going to be something I'm going to talk about and they know that, that my, my project manager is going to ask about it when the change order comes up. I don't want it to be kind of like the first time they deal with something is, you know, half, halfway after they've bought and they've been in the middle of a project. And it's involving, you know, I've already added some changes to this slide show today and I'm going to take back some ideas I got today from talking with Kevin and incorporate those into our sales process as well. So these are the stages we go through. You're going to probably find, you know, similarities. I think when I looked at your pop-up menu of sales processes, you go into Salesforce or any other kind of CRM, you're going to see stages or statuses the sales process goes through. These are the ones that we track currently as Skeleton Key. The ones that are bold are the ones that really are the ones where the client is involved. You know, so the client, you know, comes in as a lead. Um, there's some kind of prep work I do before I meet with them. There's some kind of prep work I do before I interview them. There's some kind of prep work I do or estimating I do before I review what I came up with. And then there's some kind of uh, process which goes out to them where then we meet and talk about are you going to move forward and do this or not. And along the way we've been trying to refine this language to help it communicate exactly what's going to happen. I'll point this out right now, first I'm going to stand up. If anyone has a better name for this, I'd love to hear it because I'm trying, you know, if you hear what I do in that meeting, it's just a mouthful and so it kind of sucks. <clears throat> Alright, so it all starts with the lead. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to market and find customers or come up with ideas of, you know, things that you might want to pitch to your boss, but um, you know, in our experience, they're either inbound contacts that are coming from a prospective client um, or a request coming from an existing client, which I think in some ways, if they're not small, should be treated by the same process. You might do it with a different set of people. Maybe your you know, senior developers or your project manager is going to take them through the same process of gathering requirements and doing an estimate and getting approval and so on. But um, if it's big enough and meaningful enough, I think treating every opportunity equally gives you two things. It gives you visibility to what's really in your pipeline. So it's not like you've got all this new work coming in and then you've got all this existing work coming in and somehow you don't have any of that all together in one pile for planning's sake. Um, sometimes you're going to be doing outbound stuff. This is an area we need, we need work, skeleton key, you know, just outbound follow-up on completed projects, making sure we're following up on enhancements or someday maybe ideas that we never got approved for but that are the future work that we should be doing. And then just having a good customer relationship management process, a way to kind of stay in touch with customers on a regular basis, whether it's licensing or quarterly meetings whatever. The way we get leads these days is people contact us mostly. They, they email us, they call in, they get a referral, and they contact us in some way, or we meet them somewhere. For us, the most important step on expectation sitting here is to always get back to them within 24 hours. Our general rule is if they call us before 4 p.m., we're calling them back that day. 
and if they call us after 4 p.m., we're calling them back in the next morning. And I'll tell you, that's probably one of our killer secrets is Skeleton Key. The number of times, I think probably once a month, a client says to me, you were the only one who called us back right away. You're the only one who responded to our email the next day. Like, I didn't, I called three companies or I posted this to six web forms and you're the only one who got back to me. I don't know who those other companies are that they think they don't need the business, but you're the only one who's actually engaged with me. And that's, I'm like halfway to closing them at that point because they already feel like I respect their time, I take them seriously, and so on. So um, this could be true whether you're, you know, even if you're just like meet somebody and they call you and leave a voicemail and you like them, like don't let it sit there for three days. Call them right back. My next step, or I should say my assistant's next step when she responds or we respond to that first call is to, the only thing we're trying to do is schedule the initial meeting. Um, while that scheduling is going on, and assuming it's taken place and the meeting's been scheduled, I start doing a little bit of research. This maybe takes just a few minutes to do, but the point is I don't want to show up at that initial meeting unprepared. Um, so I just want to know who are they? Where, first of all, where are they? What geography are they in? Time zone are they in? Things that are going to make it smoother as I try to schedule things. The number of times you can schedule a 10 a.m. meeting and then the person's like two time zones away and you miss each other because no one's even paying attention to the fact that they're in California or wherever, that, that, that kind of just makes you look foolish right off the beginning. Uh, who are they? Or, you know, uh, can you find them on LinkedIn? Uh, can you find out if they're the decision maker? Are they ahead of a company? You know, th what website? What does their website look like? What industry are they in? Who are they speaking to? Who are their customers? Do they have a listing of who their staff are, how big they are, how long they've been in business? And more important than anything probably is what did they actually write into the web form of the email or what did they actually say to the person on the phone? Because if you ask them to repeat that again, it's really kind of embarrassing. Like, so why am I talking to you? Well, I wrote it in the form that I filled out. I wrote you like a novel of why I needed your help. And did you read it? Did you, you should start by asking me questions about what I wrote already. So a lot of resources, this takes really no effort, but it's something that you should do before you pick up that phone for that first phone call or whatever it is that you walk into that first meeting. So you look at least like you care about the possibility of working with them. Then you have the initial meeting, which is really in many ways all about for us figuring out are we a good fit. It's a very brief meeting. I spend 15 to 30 minutes usually on the phone because most clients are coming from around the country and you know there's only so many that are local. Even the local ones, I'd just rather not invest 45 minutes to an hour of driving around just to go sit down for 15 minutes and find out we're not a good fit. I'd like to be more efficient with my time. Um, and I just want to find out things. What do they think they need? What do they think, uh, uh, why do they think they need it? When do they think they need it? You know, the think they part of that is because clients will often tell you, well, I need you to do this and you do that and I need you to do this other thing. And it's, that may very well be what they need. It may also not be at all what they need. You know, they may need a brand new system. They may need to, they may need to, I'm going to say this on this recording, they may need to get rid of FileMaker. You know, I got a call the other day from a company. This guy was trying to convert these FileMaker files, and it was like a huge company and two people using FileMaker from 20 years ago. And the whole point was he just wanted to get the data out of it. And so I just told him how using a trial he could convert it and get the data out of it. It was like three flat files. He didn't need to be sold on, you know, something major, but he thought he did. He thought he needed to buy licensing and, do all this other stuff. And so that's an extreme example, but the point is you kind of take it all with a grain of salt. I'm trying to get them to give me the big fly over the whole thing so I can figure out can we help them and can we help them in their time frame and do they even have a budget of any kind that I can help them with and, you know, um, do I really want to work with them? Like am I talking to someone who's really clearly, you know, just kind of fishing, kicking tires, not sure what they want, not sure when they want it, I'm just trying to get the right feel. Um, and I tell them this, that this whole entire meeting is about can we help you and are we a good fit to help you. Um, if it is, um, I lay out what's going to happen next, which you're going to see in the next slides or you saw in that previous slide with the bullets, and I try to schedule the next interview. This is when we're actually going to get into the nitty gritty. We're going to look at their files. We're going to look at their, you know, their screens. We're going to talk about the workflow. We're going to do all that stuff. Um, I answer any questions they may have about us, you know, whether it's are you certified or where are you located or do you really have an office here or you know whatever it is that you want to know about us, hourly rate, the things that matter to them whether they're the right things or not. Um, and I try to get into discussions about who's going to come to that meeting, who's got a stake in this process, who's a decision maker and so on. Um, if they're not a good fit, I try to offer them something else. It could be you should go look at this free resource, download the FileMaker Basics training guide, consider taking a course, maybe you're a candidate for coaching, maybe there's a community college, maybe there's something you can do that will, lynda.com. Um, maybe there's even, a, you know, someone called me from Reno and they were looking for help with FileMaker and they really just wanted some coaching and they're literally at the back door, like two blocks away from another platinum level company. It's silly for me to suggest he works with me coaching. He could go to the user group meetings there and get all the free coaching he wants. 
So that's what I recommend it because that was just the right thing to do. In the long run, hopefully that guy will have a good feeling about me, and that's great. I've got a, a letter on my wall from a doctor where I told him that in the initial meeting he shouldn't work with us. I told him in the client interview he shouldn't work with us. That he was spending money the wrong way all the way to the proposal, and he finally said, I'm not going to work with you, and then wrote me a letter saying, thanks, you're right, I found what I needed on the web. It was a software as a service. I should have listened from the very beginning and saved us all that time. And in some ways that's kind of rewarding because in the long run, the, the stickiest clients are the ones where it's a good fit from, you know, from the very beginning, not the ones that you kind of shoehorned into the situation. So what do you do after the initial meeting? You're scheduled for the client interview. You do more research. <clears throat> Often it's not a lot because they haven't given you very much. You review what they've given you. Sometimes they send you files. Uh, maybe you do some cursory research on things, like they say, well, we really want to integrate with Salesforce because we're using Salesforce, and so you go and look and see if Salesforce has an API, and if so, is there a developer program, and now you at least know when you get to the next meeting that there's an, a pathway there for you to do some kind of integration. Or maybe they mention some third-party, you know, solution that is industry-specific, like Spectrum Accounting for Contractors, and you've never seen that before, and so you go and look and see if there's any documentation on the website to get a sense of whether or not there's going to be an easier or a difficult road ahead. Um, so you don't always have these kinds of clues. They don't always come up in the initial meeting, but the hope is that they do. And again, these are just an opportunity for you to come more prepared to the client interview. I often invite clients at this juncture to exchange an NDA if they want to like, protect the information or to send me their files if they want me to hit the ground running. Most of them don't, you know, but the point is, is I want to get ahead of it so that the next meeting is as effective as possible. And then the last thing is you could consider if they're already using FileMaker, contacting FileMaker Inside Sales and seeing, you know, what licenses are they on, what is the renewal date, you know, any kind of information that might be helpful to you because invariably at some point you're going to deal with licensing as part of the conversation and it's good to know already where the client is. It's one less thing that you're going to have to go back and do later. Um, the key thing here is balancing, you know, not over-investing in this client until they've actually spent more time with you. You know, if you spend like an hour doing this and 20 minutes with FileMaker figuring out their licensing and then they never show up for the client interview, you're kind of hosed. So there's a little bit of a balancing act here as to how much you felt that they were really engaged with you and doing only what you need to do here to be prepared for the next meeting. <clears throat> I would love to sit around and read this whole thing to you, but the gist of it is it's one of my favorite Dilbert cartoons. Um, I'll let you guys read it. <clears throat> it's all about gathering requirements um, and the fact that clients don't necessarily know what they want um, and they often want you to help them figure it out. Um, and that's good. They sometimes come to you telling you what they want, but there's a lot of other layers there that aren't exactly clear. Um, you know, we run into that all the time. Even when we think we're crystal clear, then they, you, know, you hand off the project to the developers in the very first meeting, it's clear that even though you guys went through this whole process together, even though they signed on the dotted line, they still had some other thing in their head that they're asking the developer to build, and they come right out of that first meeting and say, uh, we got a problem. So uh, this is really where the art piece comes in, I think, more than anything. There's a little bit of science you could use in here. Um, we tend to spend about 60 to 90 minutes. We tend to do this on join.me or WebEx or someplace where we can record it. I prefer formats which can be recorded and fast-forwarded so that you can kind of play them back at Mickey Mouse speed so that when you're doing your estimating later, you can kind of zip right through it. Some formats are better than others. Lots of different approaches you can take here. Tell me a story. You know, let's do some envisioning. Um, ask lots of questions, explore different options, follow a checklist. I used, to have, I used to have a checklist back in the day, which was how many users, what kind of operating systems, what size screens, things that I wanted to learn to remember. Anybody on Wi-Fi? Now it's are there any people in the field? Are they using iOS devices or Android devices? Do they work offline? Do you know what I mean? You know, blah, blah, blah. And eventually those checklists will lead to a, kind of a more natural discussion. But it really is a combination because it's easy to forget things. It's easy to get caught up in the discussion and lose sight of some of those technical elements. So from a development perspective, the utility here I think is um, it's useful to have some of the kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, lessons learned kind of best practice kind of things you should always remember to ask about. Like screen size for years was the killer. I don't know if anyone else remembers that, but for years before everyone had like high def displays, you know, you couldn't count on everyone having a 1024 by 768 display. You'd forget to ask about it. You'd build solutions around 800 by 600. They'd have someone with a 640 by 480 old tiny little monitor, and that person couldn't use that solution without scrolling all day, and they hated you. And so um, the, these are the kinds of things we now know. Oh, well, everyone's got large screens, but we're kind of done it like 100 times, so you ask those questions. There's lots of pitfalls. Um, a lot of people get stuck on the status quo. Um, we know a client who built this great big system. It helped people search 100 data sources with one search field. And every time they tried to show it to people who used to search 100 data sources one at a time, they'd have them search 
one at a time in this new tool. They just couldn't get their head around the idea that this tool made all that complexity go away. And it's very easy when you go through a client interview to have certain clients who are just like, well, here's the way we've always done it, so here's the way we need to do it in the new system, and not see the opportunities to automate processes or streamline workflow or kind of criticize what they're doing now to find a way to do it better. Sometimes they just can't see the forest for the trees. They just don't understand what it is you're talking about. They need to be shown examples. They're just too stuck on a particular detail to see the big opportunity, and maybe you're talking to the wrong people. Maybe this is going to change the way the company works, and you're talking to someone at the very edge of the process. And then you've got people who hijack it. You know, and so these are just people who get into the meeting, and they just keep raising objections or talking about the existing legacy systems you have to integrate with that this can never replace. And um, So these are the kinds of pitfalls you can run into. Um, Next steps for me are always at the end of the client interview to say, well, okay, well, we've talked about this and you've shown me that and I've seen your databases and so on. I want a copy of this. I want a copy of that. I want a copy of the other thing. It's great to have a Mickey Mouse fast forward recording to go to. It's often for me better to actually have my hands on the actual files, um, especially if they've been showing me spreadsheets and there's three tabs that they didn't show me and I want to look at those tabs because I want to see what other kinds of things are they doing that we didn't talk about that I might want to bring up as possible things that need to be done as well. Um, I only schedule the, the next uh, client interview if it's clear that we have more to co cover. I still want to stop. If we get to the end of 90 minutes and there's clearly a mountain of stuff we still need to talk about, I've got two choices here. I can either start to move them toward a discovery or a design and planning project, or I can decide I'm going to ante up and I'm going to go ahead and do another you know, client interview with more people and more time, but I'm going to do it later because I want everyone to take a breath, a breather, get desaturated, do something else for a while and come back in a few days or a week later and continue. It's a way to also gauge whether they really are, you know, this is like, is the, I hate to use these analogies, is this fish really on the line or are they just enjoying this one conversation and just wasting my time? If they're going to show up a week later and do it again, they're probably very interested in liking what we're hearing and liking what we're talking about. Um, I also try not to schedule the next step, the review of recommendations, unless I have the artifacts. So the last thing I want to do is say, okay, it's, one, it's Monday, we're going to meet next Monday, and I'm going to have my estimate ready, and then it's Thursday that they get me my files. It gives me like 24 hours to do the work without impinging on my, my family life. So I'll tell them, you know, the next step is yours. I send you an email. Here's what you're going to send me, and then the clock starts ticking, and once you get that stuff to me, then we call you and say, okay, a week from then we're going to have our meeting. So I make it clear to them the expectation on them is to get the, you know, the ball is now hot potato in their hands. They're going to hand it back to me when they give me the stuff I asked for. Another reason why having that non-disclosure addressed early up in the process, if you're dealing with a client who's got sensitive material or things that they do, is because that's already done. Now they can just send me the files. You know, they don't have to worry about, oh, I got to go to legal and da 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 da. Like if you get that stuff done before you actually have the interview, then it's all behind you. So I want you to notice that there's no darts in the bullseye. None. Because this is estimating. This is the slide on estimating. Um, and there's a little bit of a nod to you there, Kevin, in the middle there about lots of different approaches. So um, you have to decide for yourself how much time you're going to spend estimating and who's going to do it for that matter. Um, you know, I learned a great lesson today about involving the developers more in the estimating process. Um, I tend to do this myself. I tend to give myself not enough time to do it. Um, but I still cap it. I give myself an hour or 90 minutes, whatever it is. Um, there's lots of different approaches to this, um, you know, to quote, and I hope I'm not misquoting you, parametric, you know, this thing takes, you know, this is very much a commodity kind of thing, unit cost times quantity, or this feels and smells and looks like some other project I did, or I'm going to come up with some sort of a mathematical approach, a three-point approach, um, or just winging it, which is what I think a lot of us have done over the years. Um, there's all different kinds of checks and balances you can use. Uh, we've got all kinds of multipliers we use, um, you know, X number of hours per week and X number of weeks, which means X number of meetings, and then for X number of hours of development, I want X number of hours to design and test it, and you can take approaches like that. Um, you can do contingency planning. Sometimes it's a percentage of total. Sometimes it's just a balance, like X amount of my hours and dollars or whatever it is I think it's going to take is going to be spent coding, and X amount is going to be spent doing everything else, and what's the kind of litmus test between those two things. Um, and you can do other things like use different billing methods and approaches. You know, you might start with a design project. You might start with a value price project, which makes you feel a little bit safer about how much dollars there are. How could you possibly not build it for that much money? Um, or using target cost, which is an approach where you kind of split the risk with the client, or time and materials where they, they bear more of the risk. Um, there's, there, this is in and of itself an entire presentation. We're kind of hoping that someone might be willing to do for us 
at some other future meetup. Um, so we're not going to get into deep there because this, this would benefit from taking a couple of case studies, I think, and maybe kind of going into the nitty gritty of how do you take this story a client told you and that you teased out of them and turn it into a list of deliverables and then estimate what it could possibly take to do that. There's so many assumptions built in there. What's their aesthetic? Are you starting with existing code? Do I have some sample or template files? Am I going to build this off a commercial template? You know, is this a client who needs it to be polished to a high sheen or is this a client that needs this to be like rough and dirty and get it done? Are there mobile users? Are there web users? Web direct, custom web publishing, it goes on and on. Currently, that's a great question. Um, currently, uh, so the question for the recording is: Do we have a do we project a preference? Do we kind of push a client maybe in a direction from early on? At Skeleton Key, we do. Um, we indicate to them. Uh, I don't know if I do it as much in this step or in the next step when I actually review the recommendations. We, with new clients, like to do target cost, and and basically for us, that's a blend of time, materials, and fixed fee. Um, I'm happy to send you a one page on it. Um, that kind of says, look, we want to be transparent, we're open book, right, that's our culture. We want to talk about the numbers, but we don't want to carry all the risk of a fixed fee, and we don't want you to carry all the risk of a time materials, because what if we're wrong? What if our estimates are wrong? What if we missed something? What if you missed something? Um, and, you know, maybe you get this budget and it's constrained, and so we have to have some way to share the risk. And for us, target cost does that. It says, you know, if we're over, we eat half the costs, and if we're under, we keep half the savings. Um, so that's what we push people toward now, for our first project. It's not a requirement. It's not for every project. Um, some clients love it. Some have even adopted it for themselves in their own companies where they do completely different things. They just sell different kinds of services. Um, I'm starting to look at value pricing and fixed fees more and more because I think as an organization there's maybe a better opportunity there for profitability or leverage or something. But um, I'm still, it's in its infancy for us. Um, how about you? What do you do? this or this, one of the three, and that's what we hold for you, so that your profits are understanding. Because I'm fairly new at this, right? I've been doing this for years now. It's very difficult to move away from time to period, right? Oh, yeah, no, I'll do that job. I estimate two an right. hour. Uh, until you build up the portfolio, I think, of solutions. Also, in the estimating ahead of that question, There's been no mention of a return on investment analysis as part of your estimate. Right. If we do this, this will mean you do X, Y, and Z. Do you try to quantify that to make the small and any estimate? No, that's a great question. <laughs> we don't. Uh, we talk about it, and you're right, it's absent from the slides in this presentation. Um, there's really no, there's no literal discussion of ROI here. I know it comes up in all the conversations I'm having from initial meeting on, because as a business owner, I'm always an open book. I, I kind of want to know why are we talking, what is this going to do for you. It helps me uncover features that are needed. Like I'm thinking about a company that you know, um, they sell, um, they sell you know just basically um, um, uh, paper materials you know to companies. They people buy these are kind of like transfers, you know, and uh, an inventory question. And it wasn't entirely clear. Um, they were talking about wanting to do inventory tracking, and you know, it was all physical stuff they were talking about. We don't know how many we need, and I was. They weren't saying it, but I was like, "Why are we doing this? You know, what's the whole point?" The point was is that they would have these rushed needs for stock that was missing, and they had no visibility when it was gone, and it it had to move heaven and earth to set up and make more of them. And when they did make more of them, they didn't know how many more to make because they didn't know what the demand on the stock was going to be. So they'd say, "Well, let's make a thousand. That would be more than enough." And then they make a thousand, and they put it in there, and then three days later, it would be drained out again because they had no visibility to the, the pace at which it was being sucked out of inventory. So they needed this to stop having these rush situations, which bottleneck their entire production workflow, so that they could have optimal production of the right stock. And they wanted to be able to do it as infrequently as possible because of the disruption. That was worth a lot of money to the company. And so in doing that, I helped them understand that even if this solution cost them as much as the changes were going to cost them, because they were like, this solution costs us 20 grand. Your changes are going to cost 25. How is that possible that we got the whole solution for this and you're going to cost more to do it? And uh, 
the point is that it was much more complicated than the original solution and we, we were more expensive than the original dye, but really what it came down to, I was trying to get them to understand is, this is worth it. Back then you had a basic information management problem. Now you've got a huge cost of production problem. And so this is worth it, regardless of why it couldn't cost that much. Any tips you can give us on getting why and what it means to the customer? The best tip I think I have is I, I lean on open book a lot. I lean on what I've learned in the last, how many years have we been doing now? Six years of open book management? Yeah, about almost six years. You know, for five or six years, we've been open book, which means for us, we share the profit and loss statements with our employees. We share the balance sheet with our employees. We talk about budgeting and how we make money, what the cost of goods sold is, which is basically the labor. <clears throat> and we help them understand and give them a, um, and, and we regularly review those numbers weekly, monthly, quarterly, the whole thing. So I kind of bring that to every conversation with a client, basically saying, I'm a business owner. I'm trying to understand why you're doing this. Um, and I know that it's possible when I ask that question that business owners who are hearing it are going to think that I'm trying to, or I ask, what's your budget? Which business owners hear as, how much have you got to spend? You know, because I'll spend all of it for you, you know? And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll say to them, I want to ask you the following question. I want to ask you if you have a budget for this, and I know you're going to hear, how much money have you got in your pocket? Because I'm going to take all of it. But honestly, I just don't want to pitch you a solution at 30 grand when you've got 15 to spend. I'd rather help you figure out how to get the most of what you want for the 15 that you've got. And if we can do it in 12, save three for something for later, because hopefully you'll spend that through with me just on something else that you need. Whether they believe it or not, I don't know. I'll tell you recently, I've got an, an, an email in my outbox that said, um, client basically ran into that. They needed, they needed $50,000 worth of development as far as I was concerned. I spent a lot of time with them um, in a sales process that was probably twice to three times as long as it should have been. And the long story short was that they wanted all this stuff and it was going to give them incredible capabilities and reduce frustration and delay in billing and it was going to have enormous value, but they were stuck on dollars. They were just shopping on price. And so they said, you got to bring your price down or we got to keep this simpler. I said, the only one who can make this simpler is you by dropping the functionality that, from your needs and doing it in stages. That's what it's going to take, whether you do it with me, Kevin, or someone else. You're going to spend that kind of money eventually to get what you want. It's going to be worth every penny. I can't help you make it any cheaper. You know? and, and they just weren't seeing it. So I think that for me, it comes down to put myself in their shoes, try to build rapport. Um, try, I, I think I probably should add this to my final slides on what we could do better. Do a better job of reminding them, you know, I have the objectives section of my, you know, see at the end here, the objective section of my proposal, which talks about why are we doing this, to kind of hit those nails on the head, remind them that this is going to solve this problem and increase sales or reduce costs or mobilize their workforce or eliminate redundancy or get rid of manual processes, you know, kind of hit those. But I don't necessarily always tie those to dollars as I'm doing it in the documentation I give them. Um, and then to hold hold the line, to not do a job. We, we're not a good fit doesn't, isn't always because we can't do it or that we don't have the skills. Often it's because they're not the right client, they don't have the right mindset for what is going to be a continuum of development to invest in a tool that can give them enormous leverage. But if they're stuck on, they want the cheapest tool or they want the cheapest company, then they've got to do it a different way. There's occasions you see the two user system ready to spend five digits, six digits, very rare. Um, but that's a really easy check, right? For me, and I, and I think just to add a little bit of the conversation, um, the, the right price is what they're going to pay. But it's very inefficient negotiating at Walmart for a banana. Right? So a, as you engage different customers, you'll see a lot of times. Um, how you go about the value pricing is vastly different. We, we once worked with a, a customer who, who basically negotiated contracts for entertainers. And I walked away from that deal spending way too much time, like you said. And, and that was my first thought. If they can negotiate for a banana at Walmart, they would. 
because that's what they do every day on every contract, on every concert, at every stage, every movie, every, and so, um, you know, but if you do get to the, the equation of value, right, um, then you know that's going to be a big one right here. Because you want to build the system for a Mac is not a great value, but you have parallels, right? So you have to constantly try it. It's an art. And, I'm, and I'm, the last thing I want to say about the value billing pricing thing, because I want to reference some other resources that are worth consuming and, and get to the end and we can have an open conversation, is um, I've just recently started engaging in talking with Jonathan Stark and trying, I talked to Kirk a long time ago about that and the value billing and just didn't really buy into parts of it. And I'm, and I'm still struggling with the whole company versus freelancer. Like an individual has a lot more opportunity, I think, to experiment with that than a company where I've got fixed costs are different. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm also learning stuff about it I didn't know, like uh, ratios of what the value is to the customer to what you think you could do it for and what, what works for customers when they're buying and such. So there's a lot there. I, it, Jonathan Stark is a great resource for that if anyone wants to pursue value billing. He references all the people before whom we talked about it, you know, whether it was, what was it, Joe, you were mentioning today? Ron Baker, Ron Baker Alan Weiss, you know, um, so there's a lot of information out there about who? All for it, 100 percent, yeah. Yes. Yeah, big sea change for Jonathan and worth pursuing. So, and he talks about it in the context of web developers and other developers, freelancers and so on. Um, I'm, I've been having some conversations and trying to consume that material, trying to kind of experiment with it for us. And I think I think you're you're right though. You, what Kevin said about every client opportunity is a little different. Some client opportunities are more appropriate for different kinds of pricing models. Conversion projects are different than other kinds of projects. Um, you know, there's some clients I I know don't have deep pockets and won't be long-term opportunities for us, but they do good work, and I want to make it easier for us to help them get started. Or maybe this is their first dip of the toe into the FileMaker world, and I want to give them an easier ramp to get into the using it, because I'm certain that this platform is going to revolutionize or transform what they're doing. So that's not entirely altruistic. You know, there's a little bit of, you know, I'm a businessman. I'm trying to generate business and feed my hungry developers. But um, the point is, is that there's not a one-size-fit-all it's all pricing methodology. You just will need to have all, I think in fact having all these options is kind of like having several different weapons when you're playing an RPG, right? You just, different ones at different times work at different spaces, right? That, that resonates, okay. Uh, best practices, I think, are having at least two sets of eyes on every estimate to see your blind spots. Um, having a someday maybe list. Um, this is the list of things that you said you wanted to do but that we decided that we weren't going to estimate or that we estimated and then when we went over the estimate you said no. I don't want to have those accidentally come up later as, but I thought you said that was included. So I've forgotten to do this a lot lately and it's come back to bite us. Where clients said, but I remember talking with Mark for 15 minutes about this feature, but it's not on the estimate. Well, but we talked about it. Well, it's not on the estimate. Well, if it was on there with a big zero next to it, it would have been crystal clear to everybody that it wasn't included. So that's a great option. Um, and then sleeping on it. For me, I estimate and then I always got to go back and look at it, not an hour later, the next day if I can, because then I'll see stuff I didn't see, I'll remember things I didn't remember, and so on. Personally, I also like to diagram. I like to do ERDs or little workflow diagrams. I'll show you some examples of that in a second. That helps me visualize the system and helps me estimate because I feel like I can see it in my brain better. And everybody, I think, um, you know, just like people learn visually, some people learn you know, with sound, everyone has different methodologies. I happen to be someone who I see it in front of me and it makes sense. So, the review of recommendations. This is where you are basically, in my opinion, taking the client on a tour of what it is you're going to do for them and what it's going to be like to work with you. Again, about 60 to 90 minutes. Again, I record it. Again, I record these meetings for two reasons. One is, well, three reasons. One is the cover your ass reason. Pardon, this is on the recording. But, um, because it's great if you needed it to be able to go back and say, you said this, or we said that, and no, even if you don't, you know, rub it in their face, literally, word for word, what was said, and you might find that you miss said something. That's fine too. The other is because I like to, as much as I can, even though it's not necessarily time efficient, be in the minute, be in the meeting, be in the discussion, be in the interview, be in the review, answer the questions, not be stopping and typing. Hold on a second, you know, like that's really disrupts the flow. So, um, and then of course, when you do your handoffs to your developers, you, you pass it to the people do production or the project manager, this becomes a critical artifact and resource for them of details, nuances, voices, you know, whatever it is that they need to be able to refer to. Um, uh, so I always talk about how we do what we do, our development process, how we charge for what we do, the different choices, fixed fee, time materials, target cost, 
And like I said, I like to use pictures, uh, diagrams, wireframes, samples, there's a typo. Um, and uh, because those often help me. There's obviously an investment in those. I almost always have an ERD because it helps me. Once in a while I have a wireframe if I feel like the people I'm showing this to aren't really seeing in their mind's eye what I'm trying to explain or if I feel that who I'm showing this to isn't necessarily all the people who are going to see it. You know, it's one thing to be in a meeting and show them a sample database, a FileMaker starter template or a seed code or a screenshot or an existing customer solution, and they're, they're nodding and they're getting it and everything. And then when you're not in the room and they're showing your proposal to someone, that sample screen is not there in front of them. And it can't be in the proposal because it belongs to another client or not yours. And so sometimes I sketch out something just because I know it'll carry some weight downstream when I'm not around if this is like a delayed cycle of purchasing or something like that. Yeah, so personally I use OmniGraffle for all my diagrams. Once in a while Visio, but OmniGraffle, I'm just a big fan of the product. Um, for wireframing, I've started using Basalmic. I've done some stuff with OmniGraffle, but I found Basalmic is a little easier, but I haven't used it enough to say it's really easy. Um, but those are the two I'm currently using. Um, I think I found with OmniGraffle, the more I've used it, the more I can just go back to a library of drawings and just grab ones that are similar enough to, sim you know, not the ERDs, but the you know, the, you'll see a topology diagram that shows how is it going to sync? I don't quite understand in my head what you mean when you say we're going to sync it. You know, or someone says, okay, I draw a button and a picture. Here's what the screen looks like when it's not synced. And here's the big button going red saying you must sync. And then here's the picture of it saying you're happy, you're synced. And then I can use that picture a hundred times. The same is probably true of Basalmic. If I create enough of those, I'll probably be able to go back to them and, and use them as well. So for us, currently that looks like this. Our development process, you know, kind of a uh, the Agile Manifesto, um, our four main principles, a bunch of important bullets about open book and, and the collaboration process and the sharing the risk, a li terrible diagram that describes the iterative Agile cycle. Uh, terrible, terrible diagram. I've said that probably like a hundred times this year and it's about time to redraw that diagram. Um, you know, I'm not even going to bother you with it. I'm just going to block it out. Uh, Target cost billing, which is sort of a summary of the target cost process. It's a big mouthful. I usually highlight one sentence here that says, it's a 50-50 plan, and then I explain that to them in layman's terms. I really like what you did in yours, Kevin. I steal it. Um, uh, these are the kinds of diagrams I might put together. You know, this is a really simple ERD before and after, you know, trying to kind of show them what they have now and what we're going to add and how it's going to work. You know, I try to do some indications of where there's going to be script script changes or screen changes. I don't always do that kind of annotation. Sometimes this is a much more complex diagram with many more entities. Um, I've started using optionality because it helps me when I'm narrating to them remember what the heck is going on in the diagram. It took me about 12, 15 of these to like, memorize what all those symbols mean. Um, I often will have you know, a little diagram like this when there's sync or there's a multi-office solution. I want them to really understand that there's a copy here and there's a copy there and that copy is not connected. This one is. And, um, you know, to try to really help them understand, you know, some of that functionality there as well. Um, all right. The next thing that we do is we, uh, after I show them, you know, the show them these doc, you know, show them these documents, and I say, hey, we're going to take two minutes with these, and then we're going to include them in what we send you. I, I narrate them through these diagrams, you know, because I want them to understand these diagrams and what they mean and the story that they tell. Because everything I'm about to tell them in text is going to go back to these diagrams. And so I'll kind of flip back and forth between these along the way because I really think that the picture helps. Plus, it, even though clients don't understand ERDs, don't sell them short. It takes no time for most people, I think, to really grasp what these are telling you in terms of the, they know the subject matter. They've never seen a diagram before. So you're doing something for them. Sometimes it's really new, but it kind of is simple and makes sense. So then I'll go through the requirements, the actual feature list. These are the tasks we're going to perform, or these are the functions and, and capabilities the system is going to deliver. And they could be, in layman's terms, like the user will be able to log in the system and create an invoice. Or they could be, the screen is going to have the following capabilities. It, 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 there's all different ways to do that. That's a whole other discussion in itself, like how to write a, a spec or how to write a description to a client. Um, but for us, it's all about just kind of, here are the things we're going to do, whether they're in bite-sized pieces or they're in big, lumpy pieces. Along the way, we might discuss alternate choices or options. We'll answer their questions, and we'll schedule the next steps. Right now, this is what our estimates look like when I go to that part. You know, we have a section at the top that contains, you know, some variables that drive the numbers, things like how many developers, how many weeks per cycle of it, you know, agile cycle, how many hours per week. Um, 
how many hours of project development time per cycle, how many hours of design per cycle. These are, I tell them, are like ingredients in a recipe, settings for the oven, and the idea here being that we, we come up with all the different things we're going to make, all the different things we're going to do, and then these tell us how long the project's going to take in terms of number of weeks, and then that tells me how many meetings I need, and it tells me how many hours of project management I need. I explain to them the math behind this. I don't know if that's the best way to do it. It's the way I do it, and I'm going to probably change the way I do it next week. You know, because I came here and I watched other people do it, and I talked to other people, and they give me feedback about how they do it, and then you you steal the best ideas that you see around. Um, we include some things like how big is this as a percentage of the whole, so that people get a sense of like which are the meatiest features. I like people to have some sense of if they had to cut something, what might they cut, so that it's not just kind of arbitrary. Um, and then we roll it all up at the end. You know, what kinds of expenses and purchases we have to make? How many hours? What's the ratio for us of you know? all of this stuff in the middle versus the meetings and design and quality control and other things that we do. But everyone's got a different look and feel for those. At the end of that whole review and answering their questions and making whatever edits are necessary or taking notes on the changes that the client might want, um, we schedule the next meeting, which is when are we going to touch base about your decision, which of course is predicated on when am I going to send you this document. Um, so I promise them, okay, based on the changes you've made, I can send this by the end of the day, or based on the changes we've made today, I can send this to you tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, um, and let's meet a week after that, or how much time do you need before you can come together and we can talk about where you are in terms of the decision. Um, the key thing there is I'm promising them I'm going to get them this by X time, and then they're going to have a definite time on the calendar that we're going to meet and get together. Um, just the same as all the previous steps. I'd like to know when the next step is going to be. So I call it an agreement, which is a tiny little difference in language, because, and I tell this to the client, it's because I like to say, um, I'm not proposing this to you. We worked it through together, we figured it out together, we edited it together, you did show and tell, I asked 100 questions, I did show and tell, you asked 100 questions, we edited it till it was the right size and shape, and you wanted me to put it in front of you. We should be in agreement that this is something you can do and want to do. And since I started saying that, I've had a very tiny percentage, but a small number of people say, we're not ready for this, and I didn't have to spend any more time on it. I didn't have to write up a situation summary with objectives, or put their name into the boilerplate contract language, or create the Word document, or draft the email and send it out to them as a total futile effort. I just basically stopped right there and said, okay, well, this will sit here, gathering dust until you're ready. Let's, when should we talk? Six months? What, whatever it is. Um, it's, But for me, it's also just kind of a, of a it's more of a, a soft thing. It's like I want them to think about this as an agreement to do something we've already talked about. It's something that we're, we're already in you know, accord about. Um, but whatever you do, you just got to do consistently. So you got to use the language consistently and set the expectations consistently with the clients. Ours has this process. I like to think of whether it was that previous screen I showed with the features and the different pieces or whether it's this as is just components. You know, you've got Ours is a cover page, a situation summary, you know, why are we here, what are we doing, what's the goal of this project, the objectives where I hit some of those ROI kind of important reasons and sort of actual outcomes, the R development process page, the target cost billing page, some people have a section in here about why use our company or who are our customers, then I've got, you know, what are we going to do, how are you going to pay for it, and sign. This section, signature page, used to be all the way at the bottom, so then there was the diagrams, and then there was the feature estimate, and then there was six pages of boilerplate contract language. Things like qualified operator, you're going to back the system up, you know, you can't hire my people without paying me half of their salary, um, you know, uh, force majeure, state that controls the arbitration, um, you know, who owns the code, blah, 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 trade secret protections, all the stuff that the IP lawyers put into our contract years ago and we've used ever since. And for the longest time when that was there, you know, a client would sort of read, you know, situation summary and objectives and, you know, services we're going to get and, um, you know, and then they'd have like pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and I'd lose them. And they wouldn't sign. And there'd be the signature at the very end. And someone on my team, a former sales guy, said, why don't we just move this up here? And our close rate jumped like 25%. Not that people didn't read this and it still wasn't binding. It was just... They got what they needed, and then they could sign. In fact, as I wrote this today, I realized I should probably take these and put them up there, because I think if they saw those 
the diagrams or they saw the things that they remember they were buying right before they'd sign, they remember what they're buying as opposed to right after. I don't know. Probably should do an A-B test here. Yeah, find out what happens. Well, that's a great question. So the question is, what is the minimum size project? Um, huh? <laughs> Do I have hundred dollars? Do I have hundred dollars? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that two ways. The investment I currently make in a typical project, where I go through the whole process, right? So the process isn't even done, right? After agreement out, you know, then you get to blue pill or red pill. Are they going to do it or not? Um, the typical investment for me from beginning to end is anywhere from six to eight hours of my time. You know, between, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, let's say 30 minutes on the phone call, let's say 60 minutes on the interview, let's say 60 minutes estimating, let's say 90 minutes going over it, and let's say, you know, 30 minutes putting together the documentation at the end, maybe 30 minutes at most on the phone with them at the end. If I went through this whole thing to this point, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, five hours, and that's slim. Right? If I rope someone else into my estimating, that goes up by an hour to six, and so on and so on. So six to eight, and that's why I consider like a 10 or a 12 hour investment in Outlier. There are companies out there who will do this thing. They'll do like two to three hours of conversations and whatever, and then the billing starts if you want to go any further. And sometimes we do that too. Sometimes we'll get partway into it and say, you know what? This is too big. We need to do a design project. We need to do a design and planning or discovery project. Call it what you want. You know, this feels this big. Let's do a fixed fee, something like that. Other times, I'll, you're not a good fit. We're not a good fit for you. This isn't a good fit for this. Doesn't sound like you have a budget for this. I should get you into training or some other resources and so on. Um, as a company, I want to say we don't have a hard floor. Correct me if I'm wrong, Greg. We have a hard floor. Um, but I can tell people, look, you know, even if we come up with a simple list of features, in our world, 60%. Um, of our stuff is the development, the core development. Now for us that means things including security, like just to compare this to, to some of the things other people in the room. For us that includes um, all the features and for me all the features includes interface and security and schema, you know, all coding and training, everything that we do that the customers are involved with directly all the time. And 40% is things like QA, PM, meetings, design, deployment, you know, what we call supplemental. That's sort of our litmus test. So what I'll, I'll say to people, Stephen, is I'll say, look, even if I have a tiny chunk of hours here, 30 hours, 20, 30 hours, you know, I'm still going to spit out a 40 or 50 hour project for you. So let's just do the math, 40, 50 times our rate. That's, that's the project. Like, if you're looking for us to just do like six hours of work, I'm going to refer you to some developers who do like ad hoc solo work. But it's just because of our machinery. Like, i to set you up in our system for invoicing and put you into our version control system and so on, it just doesn't make sense to take on a development project that's this big. Um, that doesn't mean we're not selling licensing to some clients and that's all. It doesn't mean we're not doing training and coaching for clients and that's all. But my feeling is then we're not a good fit for that client. If they're really looking for just, you know, what I used to do before I had Skeleton Key when it was just me, then I should find someone who's a good fit for them at that level who I know can do quality work, or I know will follow up and call them back and not leave them hanging. Um, because, yeah, yeah, and it's, but I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you on that. I'll still do it for karma, like I, as crazy as it sounds. If, if, we, if I don't have a clear indication that this, like if this person seems genuine and real, or they tell me at the beginning, I'm just trying to get a ballpark estimate. Like here's a great example. Someone contacted me the other day, they're uh, working on a, a, a good cause. They're trying to get together a budget um, and uh, to put in front of ins, um, investors to develop a website to support people who are in dire need around the world. Let's just put it that, because um, it's on a recording, so I don't want to expose their, their project. Um, we're probably not a good fit for that, but they don't know how to get where to go next. They were referred to me by a, a client, and they, she was hoping I could help them, and I don't know yet where to send them. So I told them that. At the beginning of the client interview, I said, I done some research already, I'm pretty sure we're not a good fit, you can get off this call right now and I can tell you what I know already, or I can have the interview with you, and then at the end of that I could share those notes with you and pass you on to someone there with at least a clear idea of what you want to do. Because I know software, so I can interview you through a software needs process, we just can't build the software you need because you need it to be an entirely different platform than what we can offer. Or we'd be too expensive and there's cheaper people out there for the kind of software development you need. And uh, 
they said, let's do it. And so we did the client interview. I spent an hour and a half with them interviewing them. I gave them my notes. I'm going to probably follow up with some people and make some connections for them. And in the long run, I, I may not get any work out of that. And that seems completely counterintuitive for selling. But then that's in the bigger picture of selling. It goes all the way back to our culture. <clears throat> we want to make everything we touch better. And we don't want anybody to think we're jerks. And I don't want to be a jerk. So even though I had a lot more valuable things to do, sometimes spending that some of this process, all or some of it, with the right client for the right reasons, even if they don't become a customer, is the right thing to do. Sometimes it's, it's for good reasons like the one I just described. Other times it's because you just didn't know any better or because they were honest with you, but they still seem like, you know, I mean, we've got clients that come back to us a year later. They did this whole process with us, didn't buy. And because we didn't slam the door as they left, but said, okay, well, we'll stay in touch and put them on our newsletter and left, left them alone, came back a year later and said, we're ready now. And they did their projects and they did spend more with us than we originally estimated because we were just patient. So there's a kind of a long vision thing. There's kind of a karma thing. There's kind of a, it never hurts to sharpen the ax. So keep practicing what you're doing. And sometimes, as we've talked about internally, the less risky opportunities are the best ones to experiment in. If I want to start experimenting with value-based fees, I'm going to do it on the ones I don't think I'm going to close. <laughs> it is. If they do, yeah, if they do. It could be kind of exciting. It could be kind of. But, but I mean, I'm not going to. Who knows why I'm not going to close them? Maybe they're not really buying. Maybe, um, maybe I don't really think it's worth the trouble. But you know, hey, they look at it and they go, "Wow, that's a great deal," and we get to try out some stuff. Um, huh? Value pricing. Thank you. All right. So decision. Usually on the phone. Usually pretty brief. Um, when it's not brief, it's usually a good sign. Um, my goal, I tell them, is just to get a yes or a no. I just hate lingering. I think about the, the girl I dated, and then she kind of broke up with me in college, but never really broke up with me, and I just tried to get the answer and never got it. I eventually figured out that she broke up with me. But uh, I just want a yes or a no. Um, I don't bring it up, but if they want to negotiate terms, that often happens there. Um, and then, again, next steps. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to edit this. I'm going to send it back to you. You're going to sign it. I'm going to countersign it. We're going to invoice you. We're going to introduce you to our PM who's going to start doing the scheduling. We're going to have our internal handoff and so on. So I try to help them make sure that that transition from me to the next step is clear and consistent with the process they've already been through. Um, if it was only this easy. Uh, so our customer experience, meetings, one right after the other, followed by a process that they also can see coming, the handoff, the kickoff, the agile development, which is iterative, and then the launch. What we are not doing so well, what I think we could do better as a company, um, and this is the second to last slide, is getting our development team more engaged in the estimating process so that they are actually writing the checks that I'm asking them to cash, as opposed to me thinking I still know how to estimate as accurately as I should. Um, I keep asking for feedback, but maybe, I don't know, they just don't give it to me as much as they, maybe they're intimidated by me. Greg's not even listening to me. <laughs> That's okay. He's heard it all before. It's exactly right. Uh, so, you know, I think the idea here is a good one. Is um, You need a set of eyes on it, but you also, this is a good way to teach the people who eventually will be running the show to learn the skills that they need, which is how to estimate. Plus, repeat business often comes from clients who are working with your frontline people, and so they need to how to estimate because uh, there often isn't time to go through this whole process. Uh, for, you know, for any job. Um, uh, we also don't have a very good post-sales process. You know, I really would like to do a better job of checking in how the project is going uh, with the customer, not the team. Um, I'd like to, you know, do some kind of surveys after the fact, whether it's net promoter score or just what could we have done better, you know, um, or just having some kind of milestones, like, you know, every 60 days I touch base with the client and see how they're going, talk about the future, talk about their budget in the next year, and so on and so forth. Do something to kind of help guarantee some of that repeat business as opposed to just having it happen organically. Um, and then, of course, something that everyone in sales says you should do, but I still have a lot of difficulty doing, which is asking, who do you know who could benefit from someone like us? Um, just asking for referrals is something I've just never been able to master as a comfort skill. So that's the end of my presentation and a chance for us all to talk about whatever we want to talk about. And I don't know if the audio is good enough for you to want to keep recording it or not. Thank you. Okay. Good question. 
yes, we, um, I tell the clients we like to use join.me or WebEx, whatever it is, um, for two reasons. One is uh, so I can focus on the conversation and not just the notes. Um, and so we can refer to it later and share it with them if they'd like. Um, but if they don't want me to record it, I won't. Um, almost everyone has said, no, great, sounds fine. And only a handful have ever asked for a copy of the recording. We do the same thing when we do our design meetings for the development. And I think there's a pretty high incidence of interest in recordings there, actually, because then decisions are being made about the actual coding work, much more precise and you know descriptive kind of things are happening there than the kind of informal estimating that I'm doing. Um, so again, it's, it's, I use a tool um, that's similar to the tools that the development team will use and can offer recordings just like the development team can. Um, and we go back to them a lot. Um, uh, we partly use that because we're a semi-virtual team. Some of our people are in the office, some of our people are not. So we've been using those tools to run our own huddles and meetings and such. Kind of everybody meets from their desk, level playing field. And um, but mostly, I think we use it just because it helps us stay focused on the conversation and go back and play it back. When I do meet in person, I try to use audio note and I ask the same thing. I'd like to use audio note. Let's be talk, record. I'd like to take out my camera and take a picture of the screen while we're talking so I can have some artifacts. It's not as convenient. Yeah, it's not as convenient as as um having it all together in one stream, you know, but it's still better than nothing. <laughs>